I recently watched a group of protesters, most of them young, denouncing President Donald Trump's immigration policies. They were waving Mexican flags and shouting, Si se puede! Yes, we can. This is now the rallying cry of the open borders left, but it wasn't always. In fact, I wondered if a single person at the protest knew where it came from. The slogan first became famous 50 years ago, thanks to Cesar Chavez. He was the founder of the United Farm Workers Union. When Chavez said, si se puede, he meant something very different. Yes, we can seal the borders. Cesar Chavez hated illegal immigration. He was Hispanic, obviously, and definitely on the left, but he fought to keep illegal Mexican immigrants out of this country. He understood that peasants from Latin America will always work for less than Americans will. That's why employers prefer them. Chavez knew that. As long as we have a poor country bordering California, he once explained, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes. In 1969, Chavez led a march down the center of California to protest the hiring of illegal immigrant produce pickers. Marching alongside him was Democratic Senator Walter Mondale and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the longtime aide to Martin Luther King. Ten years later, Chavez dispatched armed union members into the desert to assault Mexican nationals who were trying to sneak across the border. Chavez's men beat immigrants with chains and whips made of barbed wire. Illegal aliens who dared to work as scabs had their houses firebombed and their cars burned. Chavez wasn't embarrassed about any of this. He bragged about it. No matter. Chavez remains a progressive hero. President Obama declared his birthday a commemorative federal holiday. It's an official day off in a half a dozen states. There's a college named after him and dozens of public schools. Cesar Chavez's life is a reminder of how much the left has changed and how quickly. Until recently, most Democrats agreed with Chavez. They opposed unchecked immigration because they knew it hurt American workers, and they were right. One study by a Harvard economist examined the effects of the mass migration of Cuban refugees to this country in 1980, the so-called Mariel Boatlift. He found that American workers in Miami with a high school education saw their wages fall by more than 30% after the refugees arrived. If you believe in supply and demand, this is not surprising. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, Democratic Governor Jerry Brown opposed letting Vietnamese refugees into California on the grounds that the state already had enough poor people. As he put it at the time, there's something a little strange about saying, let's bring in 500,000 more people when we can't take care of the 1 million Californians out of work. First-term Senator Joe Biden of Delaware agreed. He introduced federal legislation to curb the arrival of the Vietnamese. Two decades later, leading Democrats were still wary of mass immigration, especially illegal immigration. As Bill Clinton put it in the 1995 State of the Union address, Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public services they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. No prominent Democrat would say anything like that today without being denounced as a racist. Clinton got a standing ovation. As late as 2006, there were still liberals who cared about the economic effects of immigration, legal or illegal. Immigration reduces the wages of domestic workers who compete with immigrants, explained economist Paul Krugman in the New York Times. We'll need to reduce the inflow of low-skilled immigrants. Mainly that means better controls on illegal immigration. That same year, Senator Hillary Clinton voted for a fence on the Mexican border. So did Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and 23 other Senate Democrats. Not anymore. 20 years after Bill Clinton told Americans they had the right to be upset about illegal immigration, his wife scolded the country for enforcing border controls. So what changed? Not the economics of it. The law of supply and demand remained in effect. It's not a coincidence that as illegal immigration surged, wages for American workers stagnated. What changed is that Democrats stopped caring about those workers, about the middle class, really. Why? Here's the answer in four simple facts. One, according to a recent study from Yale, there are at least 22 million illegal immigrants living in the United States. Two, Democrats plan to give all of them citizenship. Read the Democrats' 2016 party platform. Three, studies show the overwhelming majority of first-time immigrant voters vote Democrat. Four, the biggest landslide in American presidential history was only 17 million votes. Do the math. The payoff for Democrats? Permanent electoral majority for the foreseeable future. In a word, power. That's the point, no matter what they tell you. American workers, be damned. I'm Tucker Carlson. Thank you for watching this video. 
To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. Race and ethnicity have defined every nation on Earth, except one, the United States of America. It is defined by values. So to understand America, you have to understand American values. They are 1. E pluribus unum, 2. Liberty, 3. In God we trust. I call this the American Trinity. I made up the name, but I didn't make up the values. They are on every American coin. The first, E pluribus unum, is Latin, meaning out of many, one. When first adopted as an American motto, shortly after the American founding in 1776, it referred to the 13 American colonies becoming one nation. Over time, however, most Americans understood the motto to mean one people from many backgrounds. To quote the E Pluribus Unum Project, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, over the years, E Pluribus Unum has also served as a reminder of America's bold attempt to make one unified nation of people from many different backgrounds and beliefs. In other words, America doesn't care about your national or ethnic origins. This explains why people who immigrate to America assimilate faster and more fully than immigrants to any other country. Most of those who have immigrated to Europe from, for example, Turkey, as millions have, are not considered fully German by fellow Germans or fully Swedish by fellow Swedes or fully Spanish by fellow Spaniards. This is even true of the children and grandchildren of those immigrants. And just as important, few of those immigrants, or their children or grandchildren, will ever feel fully German, Swedish, or Spanish. But a Turk who immigrates to the United States will be regarded as fully American, as American as any other American, the moment he or she becomes a citizen. And they, and certainly their children, will feel fully American. Of course, America has not always lived up to this e pluribus unum ideal. But the ideal was always there, and it was applied to virtually every immigrant to America. The second component of the American Trinity is liberty. Now you might ask, didn't the French Revolution also enshrine liberty as a central national value? Wasn't its motto liberty, equality, fraternity? The answer is yes. America is hardly the only country to enshrine liberty. It is the only country to enshrine liberty e pluribus unum and in God we trust. What's the difference? The difference is this. The moment you affirm equality as the French Revolution did, you will lose liberty. It is a basic American value that all human beings are born equal and all must be equal before the law. But ending up equal, that's a French and European value. And if you want people to end up equal, you must deprive them of liberty which is exactly what happened right after the French Revolution and in every other society that made equality its national goal. America gives people the liberty to end up wherever their abilities, work ethic, and luck take them, meaning unequal. Therefore, professional athletes will make more money than teachers or doctors. That may be unfortunate, but that is what liberty allows. If you want equality, you will tell people how much they can earn and that means the end of liberty. And third, in God we trust. Unlike almost every other country, America never had a state religion. But it was founded on the principle that God, specifically the God of the Bible, is the source of moral values. As the Declaration of Independence put it, all people are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, Rights come from God, not from men. If rights are given by men, men can take them away. The American Trinity is the reason America became the world's freest and most prosperous country. But many Americans want to, in the words of former President Barack Obama, fundamentally transform it. They wish to replace American values with European values. Equality of result and an ever-expanding state which greatly reduce individual freedom, the celebration of ethnic and racial identity, which is the opposite of e pluribus unum, and the removal of God as the source of morality and rights.
Which set of values Americans adopt will determine whether America remains free, prosperous, and the force for good in the world that it has been? With the exception of the Civil War, this is the greatest internal battle in American history. I'm Dennis Prager. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right, and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care. You want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting edge medical treatments and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States, not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our health care system has lots of issues and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn healthcare over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free healthcare would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run healthcare takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the US. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. That's on top of what the federal government spends on health care today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way. Even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. And he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding health care costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. The lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, 
they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Thanksgiving, Independence Day, Memorial Day, holidays are a great time to riddle Americans with needless oppressive guilt. But the one that stands head and shoulders above the rest is Columbus Day. The day where progressives indoctrinate your children into believing Columbus to be Satan incarnate, the USA to be his evil spawn, and the Native Americans to be pacifists. And so now we have Indigenous Peoples Day, or as it would have been named 30 years ago, Aboriginals Day or as it would have been named 10 or 15 years ago, Native Americans Day, or as it could be named tomorrow in Canada, First Nation Peoples Day. Feeling the urge to self-inflict grievous bodily harm yet? That's only natural because the whole charade has become an exercise in hating Western civilization, which is really just an exercise in hating yourself. First, as far as Columbus goes, the guy deserves some credit, right? Flawed, to be sure, but he was the greatest navigator of his age, the first person to cross the Atlantic from the continent of Europe, and he did so without any maps and only three small ships. If you can name them, by the way, comment below, as I'm sure your professor can't. But your professor probably has taught you the tale of Columbus as a villain usually as a starting off point to indict the United States as a whole, often relying on a few key myths and some pivotal lies by omission. So to start with, I'll bet that you probably believe Columbus and other European settlers to simply have committed mass genocide against Native Americans, sorry, indigenous. But here's the truth. While there were many examples of brutal warfare between Europeans and Native Americans, neither side actually committed genocide. In fact, there was never an outright policy of Indian extermination. The Native Americans were mostly wiped out through infectious diseases that the settlers had inadvertently brought with them. Of the estimated 250,000 natives in Hispaniola, Columbus's first stop in the Americas in 1492, new infectious diseases wiped out a staggering 95% of their population by 1517. As far as genocide by violence, you can look at any historical account of even the most one-sided battles and find that they were still just that, battles. Take Wounded Knee, although hundreds of years later, I only bring it up because I know that if I don't, you will. It's become ubiquitous with the idea of Native American genocide. After all, there were 150 to 350 aboriginals killed or wounded. That's terrible. But there were also 25 American soldiers killed and 39 wounded. That's not genocide. That's a one-sided beatdown with old glory wielding in the hammer. And sometimes the massacres went the other direction. See the Apaches for reference, or the Comanches, or a dozen or so other tribes. So the natives often gave as good as they got. Not exactly the way genocide usually tends to work. Here's another thing I bet you've been made to believe. That many Native Americans, sorry American Indians, sorry I don't know what, take your pick, lived in harmony with the environment until Columbus arrived and European settlers destroyed the land with their evil technology. Truth, not only did the natives brutally take out people, but they took out entire forests and hunted species to extinction. Squatting Bear and his First Nation buddies weren't hopping into kayaks to block whaling ships, probably because they were too busy killing seals to waterproof their kayaks. You also probably believe that the Native American, sorry, two-spirited First Nation something or other culture was a beautiful, pantheistic one of peace. The truth is, not so much. When Columbus arrived, the islands were inhabited by two main tribes. The Arawaks, who were passive and friendly, and the Caribs, who were vicious cannibals. The Arawaks actually lived in fear of the Caribs for, you guessed it, the reasons being that they hunted them down to enslave them and eat them. Yes, eat them. Ironically, we get the name Caribbean Islands from those famous people eaters. The only way settlers were able to conquer this land was through the help of Native Americans who teamed up with them to settle the score with other tribes who were even bigger jerks than they were. That's not even to mention the populations in Central and South America famous for ritual human sacrifice. You think Cortez was able to command and conquer with only 500 or so conquistadors? Of course not. It took 50,000 screaming, angry allied natives who'd had it up to here with being tortured, enslaved, and forced to carry gold for the other native Aztecs. At some point, they decided to roll the dice and go with the guy sporting funny beards and metal hats. None of this is to say that the early settlers were perfect, or that they didn't carry out their fair share of pretty scummy stuff, but to use America's mistakes as the brush with which to paint the entirety of its history while completely ignoring the indigenous lifestyle of barbarism and borderline evil is inaccurate at best, dishonest at worst. There were plenty of bloody, horrendous battles between the Europeans and the Indians. When a Neolithic tribe encounters a more technologically advanced people, the guys with the boom boom sticks usually win. Columbus is not the issue here and never was. This whole Indigenous Peoples Day charade is about teaching your children 
to despise Western civilization and anybody who dare defend it. But, and again, that could just be my Western civ privilege talking. Happy Columbus Day. I'm Steven Crowder for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. I am an anti-feminist. Feminism is a mean-spirited, small-minded, and oppressive philosophy that can poison relations between the sexes, relations which for most of us provide some of life's deepest pleasures and consolations. Feminism has attempted to bully us all into accepting an obvious lie. The lie that men and women have the same powers, talents, proclivities, and desires, and that consequently, any discrepancy in their professional paths is due to bigotry and must be corrected by force of culture and law. By shoving that lie down our throats, feminism has made both men and women less happy and less free. Now, I'm going to have to speak in generalities, and I understand there are all kinds of exceptions to what I'm about to say, but the generalities remain generally valid. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy, risk-taking, and leadership. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions, such as career status and strength. What's the result? Take a look at the quintessential feminist icon, Rosie the Riveter, flexing her muscle. The truth is, any man of the same size and fitness can make a bigger, stronger muscle than Rosie can. By herding women away from their feminine natures, feminism seeks to transform them from first-rate women into second-rate men. Now, perhaps you'll protest. Isn't feminism simply the idea that women have the same human rights as men? No, it isn't. That philosophy is called classical liberalism, which holds that we are all equally endowed by God with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But wait, doesn't the Declaration of Independence say that all men are created equal? Yes, classical liberalism was an idea conceived by, and largely for, Christian white men. But, like all ideas, good and bad, classical liberalism has evolved over time according to its internal logic, so it now includes all races and both sexes. Good job, Christian white men. Thanks for the great idea. As its excuse for the damage it does to our lives, Feminism has developed the historical mythology that men have oppressed women and now must be suppressed in their turn to even things out. Let me propose a different narrative that has the advantage of possibly being true. Insofar as men and women are physical creations, their central purpose is the production of more human beings. Women are therefore fashioned in body and mind to make and nurture children and men to protect and support those children during their relatively long maturation period. All societies shaped themselves around these necessities. They created structures that formalized gender roles and attempted to ensure the paternity of children so that men would care for their own. In many societies, these structures became increasingly ritualistic and oppressive for women. But the opposite happened in the Christian West. Why? Take a look at your Bible, Proverbs 31. The biblical ideal of a good woman is not only strong, kind, and wise, she's also a creative and economic dynamo. Christianity sanctified motherhood in the person of Mary and celebrated women's fortitude and virtue in the female saints. The church created a version of marriage intended to protect women and designed the philosophy of chivalry, which instructed men to use their superior strength for women, not against them. Individuals can be incredibly abusive to one another, men and women both. But over time, Christendom tended to elevate, protect, and ultimately include women as women in the great enterprise of Western civilization. Now, the developments of modernity have created special challenges for women. Industry removed clothing and food production from the home to the factory and thus deprived homemakers of their traditional businesses. Children lost their monetary value to parents by leaving home to fend for themselves. So. While motherhood and homemaking remain the most important spiritual activities of humankind, modernity has stripped those enterprises of their former economic power. But in a Western civilization dedicated to equal rights, these challenges come along with fresh opportunities. 
New technologies and effective birth control allow individual women to tailor gender roles to their personal liking or abandon them altogether. None of this is a reason to attack men. In fact, these new opportunities are largely the result of men's inventions and their ideas. And none of it requires women to abandon the femininity which is one of the graces of our world. It's just change and progress, that's all. With honest thought and goodwill, we can adapt over time without the angry, bitter, and dishonest attacks on our human nature by feminists. I'm Andrew Claven for Prager University. The health of an economy can be measured using a variety of indicators. Common ones include the unemployment rate, monthly job creation figures, and GDP, or the total value of all goods and services produced in an economy over a given year. But a less frequently used, although very important indicator, is wage growth. While it may not be the first thing to come to mind when thinking about the economy on a larger scale, wage growth is directly linked to things like sales performance at stores and restaurants fluctuations in the housing market, and can even increase the standard of living. And when it's your wages going up, it becomes very important. Because as wages rise, Americans spend more money. But the question is, what causes wages to rise? Well, there are several things that influence wage growth. Number one, employers simply have more profits, so they are financially able to raise worker compensation. These extra funds could be the result of a jump in business performance, caused by a hike in sales or a public policy change, such as a reduction in the tax rate. Number two, the market for labor becomes more competitive. This situation can arise when the number of job openings surpasses the number of people looking for employment, a circumstance referred to as a tightening of the labor market. The lack of available workers forces businesses to compete over job candidates by outbidding each other with perks like higher wages, better working conditions, more vacation time, and other benefits. Number three, typically wages rise with skill and experience. Whether the skill or knowledge is acquired from a traditional higher education institution, trade school, or simply from on-the-job experience, wage levels will fluctuate based on the demand for these respective attributes. The rule of thumb, more education and experience in a field with room for growth equals higher wages. Wage levels can change for a number of reasons, but one thing is for sure. When the economy is doing better and unemployment is low, wages will be on the rise. Ideas have consequences, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and sometimes catastrophic, like the ideas of Karl Marx. Born in Trier, Germany in 1818, Marx didn't invent communism. But it was on his ideas that Lenin and Stalin built the Soviet Union, Mao built communist China, and innumerable other tyrants, from the Kims in North Korea to the Castros in Cuba, built their communist regimes. Ultimately, those regimes of movements calling themselves Marxist murdered about 100 million people and enslaved more than a billion. Marx believed that workers, specifically those who did manual labor, were exploited by capitalists, the people who owned, as Marx put it, the means of production, specifically factories, but who did very little physical labor themselves. Only a workers' revolution, Marx wrote in Das Kapital, could correct this injustice. What would that revolution look like? Marx and his collaborator, Friedrich Engels, spelled it out point by point in the Communist Manifesto. It included the abolition of property and inheritance and the centralization of credit, communication, and transport in the hands of the state and a lot more along the same lines. In other words, the state owns and controls pretty much everything. This notion was widely discussed and debated in European intellectual circles during Marx's lifetime, but nothing much came of it until Vladimir Lenin took power in Russia in 1917. This changed everything. Despite its repeated economic failures, Lenin's Russia, which became known as the Soviet Union, became the model for dictators around the world. Wherever Marx's ideas were practiced, life got worse. Not by a little, but by a lot. There is not a single exception to this rule. Not the Soviet Union, not Eastern Europe, not China, not North Korea, not Vietnam, not Cuba, not Venezuela, not Bolivia, not Zimbabwe. Wherever Marxism goes, economic collapse, terror, and famine follow. So, if cataclysmic failure, meaning terrible human suffering, 
is the inevitable legacy of Marxism, why do so many people, and now especially young people, defend it? The most common answer Marxism's advocates offer is that they, whoever they are, Lenin, Stalin, Chavez, never really practiced Marxism. They all somehow got it wrong. Marxism, we are told, is, at its essence, about sharing what we have, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, as Marx put it. Maybe that sounds good to you, but what does it mean? Who determines ability? Who determines need? The answer is the state, the ruling elite. Under Marxism, that's who has all the power. That's why the truth is this. Marxist dictators like Lenin, Mao, and Pol Pot really did get Marxism right. They wanted absolute power, and Marxism gave them the way to get it. Karl Marx never had to face the consequences of his theories. He lived most of his adult life breathing the free air of London, England, living off the generosity of his collaborator and patron, Ingalls, who, as it happens, inherited his money from his wealthy merchant father. Marx spent his days in the reading room of the British Museum, researching and writing. Although he was obsessed with the term scientific, he was never able to marshal data to prove his theories. There's a good reason for this. There was no data to prove his theories. For all his time in the library, Marx couldn't find any evidence to suggest that capitalism, the free exchange of goods and services through privately owned business, was a passing phase. Throughout the Industrial Age, working conditions constantly improved and wealth expanded. Marx had to rely on outdated reports to make his case. And even then, he had to manipulate the data to get it to conform to his predetermined theories. But Marx really had no interest in proving his theories. He knew that they could be put into practice only by brute force. He said so himself. Of course, in the beginning, communism cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads, he wrote. His ends could be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. All existing social conditions. That's religion, family, personal possessions, freedom, and democracy. They all had to go in order to achieve Marx's vision of an earthly paradise. But since few people give up their liberties and property voluntarily, creating a Marxist state has always required guns, prisons, and summary executions. Marx's many disciples from Lenin on never considered this a problem. Some, like revolutionary poster boy Che Guevara, considered it a bonus. I don't need proof to execute a man, Che is said to have boasted. I only need proof that it's necessary to execute him. If you're still a fan of Marxism after all the death, suffering, and destruction it's caused, that's your right. But own up to it. Don't hide behind the it's never really been tried line. It has. I'm Paul Kengor, professor of political science at Grove City College for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. Imagine you live in a small country with more than 100,000 missiles pointed at it. And imagine the leaders who control those weapons had one stated purpose, to destroy you, to literally wipe your country off the map. What would you do? Strike first and try to destroy all the weapons? Set up an anti-missile defense system? Or would you ignore the problem and hope it goes away? You can now stop imagining because these are real life questions that one country in the world has to ask itself every day. That country is Israel. And the leaders who control these missiles, and the number I gave is a low ball estimate, belong to an organization known as Hezbollah, Arabic for Party of God. Moreover, they're not rogue terrorists. They actually run a country, Lebanon. You should know something about them. Hezbollah first burst onto the international scene in 1983 when they simultaneously bombed the United States Marine Barracks and French paratrooper base in Beirut. 241 Americans, the largest loss of American military personnel in a single incident since World War II, and 58 Frenchmen were killed in the attacks. But this was only the beginning. More bombings followed, killing 24 people at the U.S. Embassy Annex in Beirut in 1984, killing 85 at the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires in 1994, and killing 19 at a housing complex for American military personnel in Saudi Arabia in 1996. 
In 1985, Hezbollah terrorists hijacked TWA Flight 847, during which they beat passengers, separated those with Jewish-sounding names, and murdered U.S. Navy diver Robert Statham. Hezbollah also supplied roadside bombs and helped organize groups who committed terror attacks against American forces during the Iraq War. They routinely assassinated political rivals, most notably the former prime minister of Lebanon, Rafiq Hariri, in 2005. They provoked numerous border clashes with Israel, which escalated into a war in 2006, during which Hezbollah launched thousands of rockets at civilian targets. Today, Hezbollah is a military force, a political party, a terrorist group, and a transnational criminal organization engaged in drug trafficking, money laundering, and arms smuggling. But the most important thing to remember about Hezbollah is not Hezbollah, it's Iran. Hezbollah is an extension of Iran, and it operates under its command. Don't take my word for it. Take it from the man who has been running Hezbollah for the last 25 years and is now the most powerful man in Lebanon, Hassan Nasrallah. Here's what he said in 2016. We are open about the fact that Hezbollah's budget, its income, its expenses, everything it eats and drinks, its weapons and rockets come from the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's pretty much always been the case. Indeed, Hezbollah is the demon child of the Iranian Revolution. Its founders were Iranian revolutionaries who operated out of Lebanon in the 1970s. After overthrowing the Shah of Iran in 1979, they set up Hezbollah in Lebanon. This is why, in the early days, Hezbollah referred to itself as the Islamic Revolution in Lebanon. That definition still fits. In the 1990s, Hezbollah added politics to its resume. This led many scholars to claim that the group had abandoned its terrorist past and its subservience to Iran, if only. In truth, throughout the decade, Hezbollah extended its murderous influence into Africa and Latin America and even into North America. Cocaine trafficking, they got very cozy with Colombian and Mexican drug cartels, phony charity operations, and a wide variety of other criminal activities brought in more cash with which to finance their political and terror operations. Today, Hezbollah dominates Lebanon. It directs the nation's major domestic and foreign policy decisions, including war. It has gained control of the Lebanese parliament, as well as its military and security agencies. It has also effectively turned Lebanon into an Iranian missile base. That's where the more than 100,000 rockets come in. Iran is working to surround Israel with missiles capable of hitting anywhere inside the country, all while pressing ahead toward developing nuclear weapons. As Hezbollah and Iran entrench themselves in Syria, where they're intent on activating a new front against Israel, the likelihood they will trigger another war, more devastating than the one in 2006, is growing. In addition, Iran has used Hezbollah to further its ambitions to become the dominant power in the region. Hezbollah operatives are deeply involved in the conflicts in Iraq and Yemen. Since 9-11, the world has come to associate terrorist threats mainly with non-state actors like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But unlike all these others, Hezbollah is a state enterprise. As such, the threat Hezbollah poses to the West, to Arab countries, and to Israel's existence is different and far more dangerous. How do we stop Hezbollah? The key, stop Iran. I'm Tony Bedron, Research Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.